Um, so um, I invited the town manager uh, with the thought that he could talk to us about uh, what the select board voted on with respect to an override, but the select board did not. But still, uh, he has uh, enjoying to come and tell us. Uh, talk to us about the override, what the possibilities are, what what's been going on, and um, answer some of our questions that we may have. Um, um, I know, notice that Len Carden is here, and um, I was hoping that we have a, a school committee member present so to sort of hear our thoughts too, so that we can go back to the school committee. Um, and um, <coughs> Let them know what our concerns um, and questions are. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all tonight. Uh, I um, I'm going to go through a couple of different documents that I sent out earlier today. One of which you may have, I believe, seen before, but I think it's just important to talk about, uh, and that is a, a set of scenarios that the Long Range Planning Committee went through um, over the last few months and, and kind of culminated in, in these numbers. Um, so first, I sent these to Tara earlier, and I, again, I believe you all may have seen these before. So um, first I'm gonna say, this is our current best guess of where things stand. Um, I will say that the numbers up here were carefully and methodically worked out and that they are wrong. Um, like all of our forecasts, as soon as you put it out, they change again. And in fact, one thing that we know is that uh, the House Ways and Means came out with its budget today. Um, we do know on the revenue side, uh, there are two public numbers that are out available right now. One is the chapter 70 number. The amount in the house budget is the same for Arlington as it was in the governor's budget. The other is unrestricted general government aid. Uh, the amount in the house budget is about $40,000 less than was in the governor's budget. There are a number of other accounts, not nearly as big, but that can sometimes have an influence particularly our, the, the amount we're charged for the kids that Arlington sends to charter schools and the amount that the state gives us back. So we should have those numbers sometime tomorrow. Um, that will be the house number. We'll see if that gets tweaked at all in uh, the house deliberations. My best guess is that it will not change the chapter 70 number. I think that's pretty much settled on. Um, the House decided to put more money in Chapter 70. However, that more money is going to towns, unlike Arlington, that, that are um, minimum aid communities. In the governor's budget, those communities got $30 per student. In the House budget, they're getting $60 per student. So they added money to Chapter 70. We, however, because um, of the dynamics of Chapter 70, because the amount of our foundation budget, in other words, what the state says it costs to educate students in Arlington, is going up faster than the state calculates our wealth, the combination of our property and income taxes and a very complicated formula the state comes up with. Our foundation budget's going up faster than uh, how much they're demanding for us. Uh, and that, therefore, we had a huge increase in uh, foundation aid, um, about 10 times as much as if uh, we were getting minimum aid under the governor's budget. So it really makes a difference if you're a foundation aid community or not. Um, one more thing I'll say about the process. So the, the House will deliberate its budget uh, and be finished with that by the end of this month. And the Senate in about mid-May will come out with its budget. Um, whether the Senate adopts the House numbers or the governor's numbers or comes up with its own numbers, we just have to wait and see. 
And then at some point, those two bodies have to come out with the conference committee report. Um, so by the end of June, or maybe even early July, you never know from year to year, we'll know what our final numbers are. In a way, frankly, it doesn't really matter. We are very close to knowing what we're gonna get. If, we're, if we shift a little bit here or there, higher or lower, by the time we have to know, which is in the fall when we set the town tax rate, there will be other numbers like our new growth and our free cash and so forth. And so uh, really new growth will be the one that matters uh, that will tweak uh, the, the numbers. The important thing is the town meeting pass a balanced budget based on one whatever particular set of assumptions uh, we sort of all agree on. Right, having said all that, uh, I'd just like to point out, and again, if, if this is uh, all uh, old news for you, um, forgive my repetition, but we started out with current status uh, where we have a um, no deficit for FY24 or 25. Uh, for FY24, we need to use about $600,000 worth of money from the stabilization fund. Uh, next year, we use, need to use um, another 11 million, which would leave about 4 million left over for FY26. Uh, all the spending assumptions that we've had in previous long range plans are the same. The only tweak I made to this plan was to assume that an FY24 would, would have, instead of the original $750,000 worth of new growth, it would have a million dollars worth of new growth. And the assessors tell me even er this early on that they're very comfortable with that because of the number of condominiums they've seen coming on and um, the new construction down by Myrak, the new housing there, enough of that will be on the books by the June 30th that we'll be able to tax a portion of that building. So um, I'm comfortable and they're comfortable with that million dollar figure. Um, if there are questions as I go along, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Um, the next thing to look at would be uh, what the asks are uh, that were discussed at the Long Range Planning Committee. So uh, the school committee asked uh, for various increases, which you can see on this line. It's about six something million dollars. Uh, a million dollars in their FY24 budget, 3.1 in FY25, 1.7 in 26. Was it 1.7? That's what it's been. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. At one point, I, okay, I know why I'm asking that. At one point I had 1.6 and 27, because that, that's because this is my what if plate sheet and I was playing around with numbers. Uh, for various increases there. There's also $600,000 worth of increases on the town budget starting in the FY25 budget. Uh, those would be for increased um, spending on roads and sidewalks, uh, some uh, money set aside in the DPW budget for potential increases to uh, the waste disposal contract, um, some money to be able to change over how we deal with some of our fields, our grass fields now we use chemical um, fertilizers on. And um, so I put some money to be able to go to an all organic system for our fields. Um, and then uh, depending on how much is used between those two, some extra money to go into our OPEB funding, what we put aside to fund health, health insurance for retirees. This also has a change in that it assumes the normal increase in spending on the town side of 3.25%, school side of 3.5%, but a revised lower increased estimate for SPED going forward starting FY25 of 6.5%. Um, so, um, and I had assumed in this case, I believe I did it in this last one too, yes, that there'd be a 5% increase in state aid next year. Uh, and the long range plan has had various 
assumptions over the years. Sometimes we've just had 1% um, increase for the future. A few years ago, we did uh, five, four, three, two, one assumptions. We've kind of gone, you know, we've just tried different things at different times. Based on the fact that there's a tremendous <clears throat> amount of money coming into education funding under Chapter 70, under the things called the Student Opportunity Act, and given that Arlington is still projected to have increased enrollment next year, which is a major factor in calculating your foundation budget, um, I thought it was a safe bet to assume 5% um, increase. And then I just went back to the 1% uh, after that. Again, when I say I, this is all uh, in concert with the discussions at the Long Range Planning Committee about what these assumptions would be. If we add these funds and uh, we need to have an override, uh, that override would need to be $7 million in order to last for the next three years. Um, and uh, if it were to last four years, it would have to be $11.2 million. So uh, traditionally, when the town has gone out for an override, we have gone from anywhere from three to five years projected uh, before we need to have another override. Um, and that's ever since the town started its override process and what I would refer to and people around the state sometimes refer to as the Arlington plan for having an override, socking money away in the override stabilization fund, and then kind of getting to a balance and then taking money out of the override stabilization fund until you train it down again. And then needed an over, another override because we have had a, a structural deficit in our spending, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so those are the two uh, scenarios that have been discussed in the Long Range Planning Committee. And um, the consensus among the committee members was that we would want to have a three-year override, uh, partly because um, that kept it to five, a 5% 5 increase over the current levy. Uh, and um, although the town has had um, overrides that are larger than that on a percentage basis, in the past, it is the consensus was that we would try to shoot for 5% and, and keep that down. And in fact, because of that consensus, both the numbers in the school line here for additions and the town line for additions came down from the original ones that we had, had been looking at and discussing because there was, just, there was a cap on how much the Long Range Planning Committee was willing to ask the voters for. Um, So any questions at this point? Otherwise, I'm just going to go to my best case scenario and explain what that is. No, OK. All right, so um, best case scenario. What I did here is I have the exact same spending assumptions as in the prior two scenarios. I have that same $7 million override in FY24 and a, another override three years later in FY27, um, that would also be 5% uh, of the levy at that point. That's where I came up with that oddball $7,809,729. That will probably not be the amount that we ask for in an override, but that is 5% of the levy. The other things that I looked at here were, um, I assumed, what if we had new growth uh, at a million dollars every year instead of um, just a million dollars for one year and having it go back down again? What if we got a 15% increase in chapter in, in our state aid in FY25? I came up with the 15% because that percentage would get us the exact same dollar amount of state aid increase um, that we have uh, that we got last year or, or that we're getting this year. It's about two. More well, almost three million dollars. Um, and then I decreased that to 10 percent and five percent year, year after that, assuming that um, there be continued to be increases in Arlington's chapter 78 because of the Student Opportunity Act. Um, there's also been some discussion about 
the potential for the millionaires tax adding more money for education. Um, I don't know because they have not yet said how they're going to allocate that money. Um, the rumors that have been floating around Beacon Hill and the Mass Municipal Association and among some of my friends and colleagues in other cities and towns is that um, they are not likely to put that money into the basic chapter 70 formula that there's been a lot of talk about putting it in things like early childhood education or maybe uh, uh, college education, you know, the university <laughs> system, higher education. Uh, again, those are the rumors that we know now. Uh, and again, there's nothing definitive has been put forward. I think they are, the state is somewhat waiting to see how much of that money comes in and when it comes in. Um, they don't start collecting the money from anybody until he or she earns a million dollars. So unless you earned a million dollars on January 2nd, you're not paying that tax yet. It usually, for somebody, even a high wage worker, it's probably not gonna take, it's probably gonna take until at least this spring before any of it starts to show up. And then depending on how people file their taxes, if they do estimated payments or, or if they hold off uh, and, until paying more of that taxes later, uh, we may not know until you know halfway through the year before that money starts to roll in. So um, I did not assume that that was going to uh, occur here. Uh, the other spending assumptions are the same. Um, and I put this out because in looking at some of the past projections that we've done, I think one of the things that I found is that uh, we have tended to be very conservative in our estimates. Now, I am a conservative financial person. I don't think it makes any sense to make wild assumptions and then hope they come true. Those, in fact, would be a disaster if they don't come true. On the other hand, um, I think if you're thinking about where we stand in the future, and what the threats are to the town's financial position. I think it is worth it to look at a best case scenario to say, all right, as we're going forward from FY24, let's say we have an override this year and uh, nothing else changes, how are we gonna track things like uh, how much state aid we get in FY25 or whether new growth is at a million dollars or not? Once you make a projection, you can see whether you're online to stay with that or whether you're deviating from it. And I would say that the assumptions that I built, built in here are not unreasonable assumptions. I could see, based on our history of state aid, getting the numbers here. I could see, based on new growth and the amount of building permits that we've been getting lately, that we could get a million dollars. I'm not predicting that that's going to happen but I think it's a not unreasonable within the realm of what reasonable forecasts are to say that we could come out this way. It could be somewhat higher, it could be lower, but I think as we're thinking about things, it's worth thinking about um, what, what the realms of possibility are. All right, I'm gonna go off of these sheets and then um, go on to the sheet that looked at our um, previous assumptions. Uh, in just a second, unless anybody has any other questions. Annie, so I've got one question. Um, so how do you, I mean, you're saying we've been budgeting conservatively and then we're putting in these um, assumptions about state aid and about building permits uh, that are a little bit more optimistic. Are you, What's your confidence level on those? If your confidence level on the more conservative estimates was 100%, is your confidence on these 75%, 80%, 90%? And, and what's the look back tell you? Like what, what do the last five years of building permits tell you that informs your position on a million dollars in new growth? So I would say that the original assumptions, the first numbers I showed you, I am, very confident that those we will at least bring in that much revenue. Okay. But I think there's a different question that you really need, need to ask, and that is, what's my confidence level that those numbers are right? 
I think they are, frankly, probably more conservative than what's really going to happen because we have, you know, 1% assumptions about state aid, given that for the last few years, um, the governor under Baker has always said that unrestricted general government aid would go up at, at least as much as the state aid revenue has gone up. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be an extraordinarily bad year if state aid, state revenue went up 1%. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, that's just not, um, there is another billion dollars within the Student Opportunity Act that needs to be distributed to cities and towns. And so again, using those ultra, I think ultra and overly conservative numbers, uh, I think are too low to, to be realistic. So do I think we'll hit those numbers? For sure. Do I think we'll do better? Yes. Um, do I think that the pot, do I think there's a possibility that we could sit, hit these numbers? I haven't calc I have no way of accurately calculating that number, but I would say there's at least a 50 50 chance. Maybe there's a 70 25 chance that we hit these numbers. Um, let me go to the other sheet, and I think that will well, let me, let me answer ask, your question. So let me ask you one more follow up question. When you look at the state budget and you look at Healy's proposal and the House's proposal at this point, are you seeing any? priorities that, tend, that lead you to believe that state aid to cities and towns will be a lower priority in this administration than it was for Baker? No, I would say that is not likely. I think Baker had a strong commitment to cities and towns. I think particularly with Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, who used to be the mayor of Salem mm -hmm. in there, uh, they will continue to support um, and frankly, I also think, um, I've just been reading a book about what makes Massachusetts unique. Uh, and one of the things about Massachusetts is that the governor, in fact, is not the most powerful person in the state. Mm -hmm. According to this book, uh, the Speaker of the House is. Mm -hmm. And um, particularly in election years, the House and Senate have strong incentives to make sure that there's enough state aid being spread around. So I think, uh, A, everybody real, there's a political commitment to cities and towns. There's also the Student Opportunity Act, which is a huge infusion of money, which is there not only because of a general commitment to state aid to local cities and towns, but because of the threat of lawsuits from school departments like Brockton, which have been horribly underfunded over the years. And, feel that the state's distribution of aid to its schools is unconstitutional. And so the state had to pony up money under the Student Opportunity Act uh, to raise that number for the Brocktons of the world. But the legislature can't just give money to Brockton. There, it there are 351 cities and towns. The speaker has to count votes. And if you're giving money just to Brockton, then Arlington and Needham and Amherst and uh, Mount Washington are not going to be happy. So you have to give everybody some money. So I, I, so I think the Student Opportunity Act is here to stay, and it is a, a major infusion of money, and it will play out for the next five years. Okay, so just one more quick follow-up then. And um, again, I'm trying to gauge your comfort level, because I think you and I think about this the same way, which is that being conservative and closer to right is better than wild-ass assumptions. So would you say that this is, if somebody on the select board or if somebody here said, no, no, I think you're all wrong, you should up everything by 10%, you would say totally not comfortable with that. Whereas these numbers you're comfortable predicting as a best case scenario, not budgeting for, but predicting as a best case scenario. So I'm just trying to gauge your comfort level here. That's correct. I think okay. you said that exactly accurately. Jennifer had a question? Oh, I just I just had a technical question about new growth. So when there is no number of new growth, it, are we assuming the 750? Or are we assuming? So uh, the the um, the default is that there would be um, in the current year there'd be 750, and then it goes down fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay, so it's 700, 650, yes, 600, okay. etc. Okay. All right. And um, so I guess following up on Annie, I mean. So your comfortable level with this best case scenario is 
looking at for the next few years, the numbers are a little higher than what we usually budget. But I do notice that it still it reverts to sort of a fairly conservative um, formula in the out years. So it, it's possible that the best case scenario is still will still be fairly conservative. That that seem fair or not? Um, I it's would I would say those years, one five years from now or something like those one percent of state aid are probably I do I think that's lower than it's, right. Uh, I, I did. So I mean I I I completely agree with everybody that having um, conservative numbers is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, that we shouldn't be overly you know optimistic when we make our budgets. Um, but um, but but we also have to keep exactly in our mind that we are being conservative, right? And that there is for example. 30, almost $34 million difference between what we we're predicting in FY19 and what we're predicting what we got in FY23. Don't steal my thunder. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, any, okay. Okay. any further questions on what Sandy has covered so far? Charlie and then Sophie. So, uh, Sandy, can you just walk us through, since we didn't get a copy of the detailed plan that, you, that lies behind these summaries, how do you get from uh, revenue of $212 million in uh, 24 to uh, 218 million in 25, which is difference of six million dollars. Um, well, that uh, number is yeah, it's the same number in all of these spreadsheets. I think I know I sent spreadsheets to various people, uh, but it's just the uh, normal growth. In fact, I think it's going to be the same numbers that you see in. Um, Appendix D in, in the Finance Committee report that Alan has been putting together. So uh, that has a 5% increase in um, uh, state aid for FY25. Uh, it assumes that there's going to be a million dollars of new growth in FY24 and then $700,000 of new growth in FY25. Uh, and then um, I think there are uh, just the normal amount of incremental increases in local receipts that we have from year to year. We usually assume there's like another hundred, $125,000 of increased motor vehicle excise taxes and um, other such fees or fines that the town collects. Anything else, Charlie? Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, so, the, so the, the chapter 70 increase of 15% in the best case scenario um, is shows up as a reduction in the use of the of the um, override stabilization override stabilization fund. That is correct. All right, I'm going to stop. Sophie, Thank you. You. Just a quick question. When talking about new growth, I, I hear condos and fees and things. Is the town doing anything to find new growth or to increase in ways, or is it's more just sitting back and saying, okay, we'll just see what we get? Well, uh, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, we have, the, the ways we can encourage new growth is to encourage people to build things that weren't there before. And so um, we try to work with developers to encourage them to look at land in, in the town. Um, we, I think our inspectional services department tries to, and, and I think increasingly has been successful under Mike Champa at um, both helping uh, people taking out building permits to get those building permits, um, but also then holding contractors accountable for what those building permits are worth. And that's why we've seen a pretty big jump in that revenue. Um, the other thing that the town has done in the um, recent years, and I think we'll continue to look at, is we've changed some of the zoning to allow people to build things that they hadn't been able to build before. So you've probably, at town meeting in the last few years, seen proposals to allow more mixed use development, i.e., let's say in the, the, the business districts, uh, you know, Capitol Square or uh, Town Center or Arlington Heights or along Broadway, if somebody wanted to take those one story buildings and uh, we would hope keep businesses on the first floor but build residential above, um, that 
we've already taken some steps to do that. And but once you do that, then you just have to then wait for the right developer to come along and, and do that. Um, you know, if somebody were to find some big piece of open space in town that's privately owned and put a, uh, a bio lab there, like what they're doing like crazy in Watertown now, uh, you know, water, I just give you that example because Watertown has gone from kind of the sleepy little budget to one where they are building new schools just based on their new growth and not getting MSBA money and not having to do debt exclusions because they have so much new growth. Arlington's challenge, frankly, is there's just not a lot of open space for us to, to do that sort of thing. Um, I think that's a good conversation for the town to continue to have as we look at our zoning and what we allow people to build here. Um, it may be the case, for example, if we adopt MBTA zoning and we allow people as of right in certain parts of town to build multifamily housing, that they will take current two-family houses and turn them into four-family houses. Um, but again, that depends on the owners of those properties being willing to do that and some developer coming in and wanting to do that. So uh, I think we are trying to make it an option for people to do that kind of building in town. Uh, we are somewhat limited because we're pretty built out, but I'd say that's what we're up to now. And what about all the empty storefronts and efforts? I mean if they're empty, they're not bringing in revenue. That is correct. So we are one of the first communities in the state to find business owners if they, um, there are ongoing conversations. Uh, so there's a, I don't know how public this is, so I don't want to get too specific, but I will say there's a large um, empty storefront right now that there are discussions with a restaurateur who would put in a large restaurant and a shop next to it and so forth. The old, um, what is it? Average American Joe's or whatever it is. Average Joe's. Average Joe's. Average Joe's. No, your average Joe's, thank you. I always get that confused. Uh, there's a tate that's gonna go in there. Um, so yet one more place to get uh, fattening, delicious, uh, you know, confections. So, um, so yes, we are trying to work with people. We have an economic development, well, we had an economic <laughs> development staffer. He's now running for mayor. Um, uh, but we have that position for exactly that reason. And so we try to, to help people along who are interested in building an art. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Um, second, please. So, um, I'm going to make this a little bigger. How's that? So, I somewhat have to give Jennifer Sue's credit for making me think about this stuff. So, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, but I wanted to look at what the history of uh, our assumptions about our growth and our, our budgets has been since the last time we had an override. So I looked at the, um, the long range plans printed in the finance committee reports from previous years. Uh, those are all snaps in time. They've changed uh, over the years, but I figured let's just have a consistent source to look at. So uh, this shows a number of things. First, it shows uh, back in FY19, uh, or 2019, uh, we were debating uh, an override. Uh, we thought that by FY24, we'd have a $17.8 million deficit. The next year, it was still about in that range. But the year after that, uh, it was down by $7 million. And then, uh, by last year and this year, we know that FY24 uh, was in balance. 
In a similar regard, uh, the next year we thought that there'd be a $24 million deficit in FY25. Uh, that came down $5 million. That came down $12 million. And now there's no deficit. Um, in FY21, we think there's going to be, uh, a, we thought there was a $24 million deficit in 26. Last year, we thought it was down to 20, it's down to nine. We'll, we'll see where it goes next year. So I think it has been the case that there has been a history of assuming big deficits in the future and that over time, they do not turn out to be the case. So what does that mean? Well, the second thing I wanted to look at was what's our revenue in town? You will not see these numbers in the long range plans because what I did is I took the total amount of revenue in any one year and I backed out the amount that's in there for debt exclusions. So the debt exclusion numbers just go to debt exclusions. These numbers go to, uh, to fund the town, the school, et cetera, the general fund. So in 2019, we thought we would have $181 million of uh, revenue. By 2023, we now know that the FY23 budget, and this is in bold, this is actual, there was $194 million. So there's a $13 million increase in general fund revenue between what we assumed in 2019 and what in fact turned out to be the case. Uh, for FY24, there was a $19 million increase. So uh, over time, the amount of uh, revenue available to us uh, was substantially bigger than we originally thought. What about spending? Well, in FY19, we thought that by FY23, school spending would be $87 million. It turned out to be $84 million. So it went down by $2.8 million from what we thought. Uh, we thought for FY24, it'd be $91 million. It, in fact, in the budget that we put out, it's at $88 million. That went down by $3 million. So school spending has not tracked as high as we originally thought it was going to be. So it's, school spending is not what's driving a deficit. Town spending, similarly. We thought in 2019 that this was where the numbers were going to be. They are, in fact, lower. Town spending has come in lower than we had projected. Use of the override stabilization fund. We thought in 2019 by, that by FY23, we would need $13 million. We only need $3 million. That's a drop of um, $10 million. At that year, <laughs> this is a little wackadoodle uh, because we thought we'd use $41,000 because that was all that was left in the override stabilization fund. So that's all we could use. Uh, same thing for that year. Then when there was enough money to use more, we thought that much. But in fact, uh, we've come down to only 588, a uh, substantial reduction. Pensions are virtually the same for what we originally projected. We really thought it was 13.3, was 13.367, an increase of $33 million. And then for FY24, an increase of $65 million. So that's been on track. Insurance uh, at last year was a little bit higher, but this year was $707,000 lower. State aid, we thought there'd be $23 million then. We in fact got 25. Uh, that was 1.2 higher for FY23. Then remember that goes into the base. For FY24, we're $4 million higher than we thought. Minuteman has been a problem, frankly. Uh, that has escalated, and this is just the operating side of the Minuteman assessment, not the capital side, because the capital side in the long range plan is all debt excluded. So the operating side of Minuteman has gone up substantially. Um, that is uh, because, frankly, Minuteman's budget goes up a, a fair amount every year, and because since 2019, Arlington has just captured a larger and larger share of the number of students that are sent there. That will start to flatten out in the next few years because they're full and there aren't that many kids from other cities and towns coming. So that should mitigate some. Um, and then I just wanted to look at um, tax, just tax revenue, not overall revenue, but just tax revenue exclusive of debt exclusions. Again, in both those cases, we're bringing in more than we thought. So I wanted to share this with you because 
from my point of view, um, given that most spending, you know, I've looked at all the big ones, insurance, pension, school, and town, those are all pretty much lower than we expected them to be. So I think over the course of years, we haven't had a spending problem. We've constrained our spending. I know Adam and I both tried to uh, keep spending in check. We have added some positions, but not nearly as many as I get pressure to add from the population, from department heads, from some of you. Um, we have had to say no over and over again and try to live within the constraints that that 3.25% or sometimes lower has presented to us. Same thing with the school department. If you talk to uh, school committee or to the superintendent, they will tell you over and over again that they have constrained their spending. Um, and so, uh, and you know, they've done any number of things like the, I know, SPED, for example, is a very controversial issue. And I do not pretend to be an expert on the school budget. In fact, I always tell people, if you're on the town side and you talk about the school budget, you'll, you'll just lose, you'll be wrong. But I will say this, the school department over the years has done a lot of work to transfer kids who have been outplaced into very expensive outplacements to bring them in-house and to change how they staff those so that they, uh, in particular, have had more full-time teachers and fewer aides and so forth. So they've done a lot of work to manipulate that, to keep costs down while providing those students who are legally entitled and as children deserve a good education to get that education. So uh, I would say both on the town and the school side, there's been a lot of efforts to, um, to constrain spending. So, Spending has been pretty much at or below what we predicted. It's revenue and the use of the override stabilization fund that has been both higher, much higher in the revenue side and using the override stabilization fund much lower than we expected. So that is why when I presented that best case scenario, I think it was important to see that if you are too constrained in your thinking about the future, you're just gonna make decisions that are overly cautious. And that is as bad as making a decision that is overly optimistic. You're trying to hit the sweet spot somewhere in the middle. You, you want to be cautious about it, conservative in your revenue estimates, but not so conservative that you end up making bad decisions about the services that the public constantly demands. And about then making choices or putting choices to the public to allow them in an override to vote on uh, how much they're willing to pay for the services that they're getting and to hear from them whether they, you know, they want, like, do they want another children's library? Do they want some of the things that the school committee has been working on uh, in its plan? Uh, so that's, those are the numbers that I wanted to share. I've been talking for a long time now. I appreciate your listening to what I have to say and I will, happy to answer any questions about this or about anything in the town budget that I can answer to the best of my ability. I know that Carol, you have some slides of your own, but before we get to those, I just want to open it up to any questions, Topher and then Rebecca. Yes, so um, this look back obviously covers the period where we had a pandemic. And, you know, what was the effect of that on these various numbers in particular was the ARPA money that came in, is that included in the revenue? For two years, for FY23 and, and 24, there's $5 million in ARPA money. And essentially what happened is our local receipts went down. We filled the gap between where our local receipts had been and uh, what we had been spending with that ARPA money until we could allow the uh, local receipts to come back. So they have, in fact, been coming back uh, fairly strongly. Uh, and so I would say it's relevant just to know that money was in the 23 and 24 budget, but I think going forward, we're now completely just reliant on our local receipts. Those have made a comeback. 
And I think that therefore we can count on that continuing to, to be there. Okay, but the revenue numbers here, number, section two, do include the ARPA money from the years that it came in. Absolutely. Um, just one other comment um, on the Long Range Plan and Minuteman since that came up. I've always noticed it's three and a half percent forecasted out. And it seems like we, it's always more than that, probably because of the enrollment going up. But we can, with the enrollment smoothing that now happens, we could, um, I think we could probably get a, a more accurate number than that. I know Minuteman in the context of these numbers is fairly small, but it's a fairly small. <laughs> Eight or nine, you know, seven or eight million dollars of operating is uh, significant. So I think that might help just make the plan look more, more solid. Thank you. I had a question on on item three, the school funding, where it's uh, this is related to, I guess, what Topher was asking about the pandemic effect. So the, the fact that we see almost 3 million less in spending for FY23, say, than was predicted back in 2019. It, how much of that is related to the fact that the enrollment dipped due to the pandemic and it didn't quite catch up? Do you know what I'm saying? Is, yeah, that, sure. is, this, is this enrollment related? So we, some of it is in that we cut $1.4 million out of the school budget uh, in FY21, I think, because their enrollment had gone down. So the first year after the pandemic, we didn't affect the school budget, but then we did catch up to that. But now, uh, as we reset them down to their new level, as enrollment is increasing, we would then add those new students back in for our calculation. But yes. Thank you. Any? Um, so, Okay, what am I going to ask here? God, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Chris, come back to me. John. Thank you. I'm here. Um, now, if you look at the, you know, the comparison of the budget, the school budget, you know, set three, four, five years ago to the school budget, that it does seem like it came down. I mean, I'm not sure, I, perhaps that related to, you know, higher enrollment expectations, but but the, the, but if you push that aside and you actually look at the school budget, you know, forget about what they thought it was going to be three, four, five years ago. But the actual spend for the last three or four years, it's gone up fourteen million dollars. So that's that's so it's gone up; it hasn't gone down. And there's also um, eighty new FTEs in the school. Um, and I, I've actually reviewed the budget. I've sat through all the presentations this year. And it's pretty clear that the, the rest of the town does stick to the two and a half percent, give or take. They're kind of chugging along, you know, not, nothing, no major increases, whereas the school does. It's a pretty significant increase. In fact, if you take those 80 FTEs and you just think of what they're going to cost or what they cost on a regular basis, if you say an FTE costs the town, when you consider the pension and health care, $100,000, that's $8 million a year. If that's high and you want to say it costs the town 75000 a year, that's $6 million a year. So when we talk about a $7 million override, I feel like we're really talking about those FTEs in the schools. And maybe they're great, maybe they're appropriate, but I think that's really what the override comes down to are those 80 FTEs, you know, based on what I've seen. I've seen everything else is kind of just chugging along, whereas, wow, that's where the $8 million is. Does that make sense? So... Uh... I don't know about enough details about the ADFTEs to be able to directly answer your question. Yeah. I, I will say a couple of things. Sure. Um, so we do um, have limits on how much the school budget can increase by three and a half percent for brick general education, uh, seven percent, and then six and a half going forward for SPED and then half of the average cost of each new student for increases in enrollment. When you factor that all in, it means that the increases in uh, the school budget have been probably about somewhere between four and a half for five and a half percent per year. The town budget has gone up on average uh, 3.25 or, or less, frankly. Uh, and um, 
the estimates for pension and insurance are respectively six and five and a half percent. So um, our, our general revenue increases based on our own tax abilities and so forth, we probably go up between three and three and a half percent a year. What makes a difference for us is when we get more state aid um, and in as much as that state aid is related substantially to our student population. So student population is both a driver for costs and a driver for state aid. So uh, I think, again, over the years, the thing that has really made a difference to us is that we uh, have seen increasing enrollment. Arlington has got the second largest uh, enrollment increase over a 10 per year period of any school district in the state. The first is Nantucket, by the way. Um, so if you have friends in Nantucket, tell them they need to calm down. Um, but, There's people moving in Sandy. I don't think it's the first grade. Uh, well, yeah, no, it, it's, it's frankly, it is the workers to tend the lawns and the kitchens the and the, the so up. forth. Yeah. Uh, but Arlington is number two. Yeah, so, uh, just, so the school enrollment the last three or four years that I'm looking at, that has actually gone from 6,047 to 5,987. So it's, for the last three or four years where I'm you know, mentioning the increase in the FTEs and the increase in the budgets, the school enrollment's actually gone down. So it went down one year. And then each year after that, it yep. has gone up some You're more. Exactly right. 6, whereas, whereas if you look seven. at, say, Newton, it's, it's really gone, it's continuing to go down. So Arlington is different than, say, Newton, because we, are, we have a dip and we're continuing to expand. Yeah. A lot of communities in the state have flat or declining enrollment over the last five years, over and above what happened with COVID. So uh, I, I think. I think the thing that is important for us to think about from a financial point of view is you know, what do we think is sustainable in terms of annual growth in the school budget uh, on, on a percentage basis? Uh, if, given the numbers I just enunciated, there is a structural deficit. There's a gap between what it costs to provide the services that we provide and the revenue that we get um, and so from time to time to close that structural deficit, the town has traditionally gone and asked the voters to increase the spending. Um, and uh, I would say that that, you know, again, that's a political question. Um, and if they do go for an override now, and if I might best case scenario in the future, um, we have another override in 27, I would just note, I don't know if you noticed it, but that the deficits then in the future are in the two or $3 million range as opposed to the 14 or yeah. $20 million range. Uh, because in the future, school enrollment is projected to sort of flatten out. Yeah, so would my kind of summary be somewhat accurate when I say that the, the, the 7 million override would relate to the increase in the school budget? And what is everyone else's? Seems to be, you know. So I would, them. yeah, I would say the override, most of that money, most of the increases that we'd be asking and are enunciating to taxpayers and voters about relates to added money that the school department would want to put in. I would say, however, even in the, in the first scenario I showed you, we don't have deficits in the next couple of years, but at some point in the future, we would need another override because, again, there is a structural deficit in the town. So the, I think the question is, do you wait till later to have an override or do you add to certain spending in line with the strategic plan that the school committee has laid out and ask the voters now if they would like to support yeah. that? So and then again, it sounds like this budget is very conservative. And um, so it looks like all the bills are paid through FY24, all the bills are paid through FY25 without an override. And then FY26, there's a $9 million deficit. So, you know, I figured the FY24 budget's done. We hear it is in April. Um, you know, if there was 4.5 million of savings in FY25 and FY26, you could push the override out for three years. So, 
Has that been considered? Well, I think that was a big part of the discussion in the long range planning committee is when to have an override. Um, it has been the town's practice not to wait to the last minute yeah. to do an override, partly because if you, you can do a smaller override a year early and sort of bank the money. And then, um, so again, a lot of discussions around that history. And I guess what I'm reporting to you is that the consensus so I'm trying to report to you the consensus sure. of the Long Range Planning Committee, as opposed to Sandy Cooler saying this is yeah, what yeah. we should do. Um, but uh, the consensus was it would be better to have an override that took effect in FY24, both to respond to the request from the school committee and to do things early enough before we really run into, we hit the crisis point, right? You know, like in 27. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. I remembered my question. Yeah, so I was also going to ask you about FTEs today. So we sometimes here talk about the increase in headcount as a driver of this budget. I'm looking at the town side, similar to the school side numbers, and we are coming in under on spending the projections that we had in 2019. And yet we know we've added headcount. So how are we doing that? Sneakily. I know you're doing it sneakily, but maybe you could tell us what your secret sauce is, and hopefully you told Jim Feeney what it is. Um, I think it is, even though uh, we have added some FTEs, uh -huh. we have been, um, I think the, the big thing about town spending is collective bargaining. Uh -huh. So we have settled contracts that are uh, high enough to be able to retain and attract staff, uh, but are affordable. So our basic pattern of, um, of COLAs uh, in, in this three year period has been 1%, 2%, 2%. For all contracts had then some other gimmies. Uh, for example, and ask me the DPW workers and so forth, we are having a very hard time hiring those people. And so we did a market adjustment for FY23 and 24 for them to, to bring them up. Um, that is one of the reasons that in FY24, I couldn't say yes to any departmental requests for any new staff because we used it all up in making those adjustments in the contracts. But again, we did that adjustment, you know, we went up, but not crazy up. We went up enough to keep our spending in line with what we knew our projections were. Um, and then to some extent, because of turnover as senior people leave and you bring in junior people, they come in more cheaply. Uh, and and um, so we've, we've had slight increases in staffing uh, but the main thing about keeping the town budget in line is your collective bargaining. Okay. Um, and on the school side, um, you're telling me you're not familiar with what the headcount's been happening on the school side, but does it seem realistic to you that we would see this drop in spending over what was projected five years ago if they added 80 people last year? I would respectfully defer that to somebody, uh, to Liz or Michael Mason, because I don't know anything about the details of those 80 positions. So you might as well ask me how a carburetor works. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know that either. We, we did present, I presented questions on, on the FTEs yeah. to the school and, and I asked them. And it's actually, you can so parse a lot of details from their budget. So I actually have some idea. I don't have a full idea, but I have some idea about where they are. Yeah, but I, I did see any details that people wanted to have. I would yeah. encourage you to talk about. They were within the limiters that we declared. Yes. Okay. So their general fund contribution has been as agreed to in all of the override agreements over the last however number of years, and they have lived within that budget, similar to on the town side. Yes, and I guess one other thing I would say in the last override, uh, you can see it in the financial plan, there were commitments that the school committee made at the tune of about $2.8 million for increased 
programs. And so it wasn't just an override that maintained the status quo. It was an override that said, we're gonna expand the things that we do. And I just mentioned that specifically because I've heard some people say that in the past, the town has not had overrides that do anything but avert financial disaster with the status quo. That's just not true. We have had overrides, the last override in particular, uh, I wasn't here before that, but where we did say to the voters, we want to do more stuff. Do you want to support us and allow the voters to decide that? Yeah, I think our questions about the ADFTE have been heard by the two school committee members. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we, in the future, I don't know we can get some information or have that address. Um, Charlie, I'm going to know that you have uh, some discussion points that you want to raise. And uh, I don't know if you have questions you want to ask first. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I have a couple of questions first. Um, and then I'd like to address uh, those slides that I sent around. Maybe uh, pass these documents. Um, so first of all, um, Mr. Pooler, um, awesome. <laughs> so uh, you constantly refer to the consensus of the long range planning, but this is your recommendation. This is not the long range planning recommendation. Am I correct there? Uh, the, the long range planning committee, as I understand it, doesn't keep minutes, doesn't take votes, and isn't governed by the uh, open meeting. Board. All of those things are true. That doesn't mean that there isn't a consensus. And in fact, uh, I am not allowed to advocate for this. Uh, I can just report the discussions that came out of the long range planning committee. So, uh, although if you were to ask my personal opinion about this, do I think this is the right thing to do? I would say yes. But in reporting that to the select board and allowing them to decide whether to put a question on the ballot, what I'm reporting is the consensus that is developed within the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, and uh, you know, when we finish a meeting, our, uh, you know, usually the chair, which who is Steve DeCourcy from the select board, will sort of sum up where he says things and so forth. And um, so that is uh, that is how it works and that is what I'm well, I understand it. You made, a, you made a report to the Board of Selectmen that recommended an override, right? I made a report to the Board of the Select Board that select board. said thank you. Thank you. That said that the consensus of the Long Range Planning Committee was to recommend a three year override for FY twenty four and that the amount of that that override would need to be would be seven million dollars i will say i did calculate that seven million dollar number i am the guy who does the numbers but i was not making a recommendation to the select board i was reporting the consensus for the library so I, I noticed in the charts that you you passed out that um nowhere is it shown where the what the override looks like uh if we, if we do a seven million dollar override and have no additional expenses and make the assumption, the conservative assumptions, and then compare that to a $7 million override with uh, the more optimistic assumptions. And I raise these questions because um, assuming that there were no additional expenses, then the effect of the difference in your assumptions would be to uh, reduce or delay the need for a future override. It is true. And, and you haven't presented that I haven't seen it to the flood board. I haven't seen it to finance committee. Um, I will say I have shared the spreadsheet that I used to make these forecasts. I've shared it with some members of the finance committee. I'd be, in the past, I've shared it with you. I'd be happy to share the latest version with you. I'm happy to put it out on the website so anybody can play with it. Uh, and people are, sort of can look at their own, you know, what ifs. Um, the numbers that I ran for the Long Range Planning Committee were based on the questions the Long Range Planning Committee members were asking and the consensus around the political questions that they were trying to resolve. Uh, one of those was not to not have an override. 
uh, or to have a $7 million override without any increased spending. Um, so that, that just wasn't something so that they were asking. You, you, you repeatedly say that, uh, you know, the voters are going to decide whether we want to have this extra spending or not. But the way I see it, this override is going to go out there with the commitment to, from the select board. And the voters don't have a choice as to whether what the, what the program is. And, and then, um, so a, a voter says, oh, we have a deficit, structural deficit, we have to take care of that. We vote for this uh, program put out there by the select board. And then when the next year comes around, the select board will announce that, well, the voters voted for this money, so we absolutely have to spend it. And, and that to me is, is very troublesome. I'm just wondering why we don't have a recommendation that says, voters, you can vote the $7 million and you have this effect on your um, future outcome of increase in taxes, or you can vote the $7 million plus the additional expenses and have an alternate effect. Um, if I may. Please. Thank you. So uh, every time, at least since I've been here, we've had an override. There is a list of uh, commitments that the select board makes to the public. Um, again, you can see that in, um, in the manager's budget, in my letter or in Adam's letters, there was a list of things. Those commitments were a combination of um, caps on spending at 3.25, at 3.5% and the spend and so forth. Of spending, it was last time around of that $2.8 million that uh, we said would go to the school department for the various things that uh, we said. <laughs> Mr. Foskett, I know that you are. <laughs> um, and uh, for the money that we put into the town budget to increase road repairs and to uh, facilitate senior transportation. So um, I also think that when we had, when COVID hit, and uh, originally we were going to put, I think it was $800,000 in the school budget the second year after the override, it was going to be 800, 800, 600, 600. We couldn't meet that 800 the second year. We could only give them an additional 140,000. But there was consensus uh, among the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, the members who were there, and uh, including very strongly yourself. I was there. I, and you, you advocated for it. And what you voting. said was we told the voters I, that this is what- I'm not talking about that history. I'm talking about where we are today. Well, but I am, the point I'm trying to make is that it is not at all unusual to say to the voters, this is the plan that we're going to put out and this is how we're going to spend the money. We're asking you to support that. And then once the voters say yes, then I do, do believe there's a, an obligation on the school committee and on uh, finance committee on the select board and on the town manager to um, follow through on it and spend the money that the voters voted for. And your question seemed to imply to me that there was something wrong with that. And yes, they're not given a choice. They're, well, I, they, they were exactly given a choice. They didn't vote yes or no. But, but Charlie, it's the select board yeah. that puts it on the ballot. The select board decides the form of that question. It could, the select board could have a menu of one, two things, 20 things, but that's the political decision that they, that they make. It's, and that's the way we have always done that. And we have, as I, my memory is, we have never given choices. We have given a question up or down. Um, so why, why would this be any, Different and and and, okay, and so are your questions more directed better at the select board? Well, that might be the case, but let me show you why I think this is different. Okay, if you can take a look at that the slides that I put up there, Tara, if you could put the first slide up, uh, not the third one, flip it back. So the, that's a chart of our tax increases. I sent that out a couple of weeks ago to most people, and I believe that that's uh, you know on a compound basis about five percent a year. And the next slide is um, just shows where our per capita income growth has been, which is 3.8% a year. So our taxes are going up faster than our per capita income growth. Then the, um, the third slide 
it's on this is on the sheet of paper that I passed around, which um actually, uh, so um what I did is um I took the uh from, from the documents that you sent out this, this afternoon, uh, this uh I took the uh, the school ads and the town ads and looked at the impact on the taxes based on a 3.5% annual growth for the schools and a 3.25% um, annual growth of the town. And each year, these compounded elements um, increase in the tax base. So that where it says at the bottom here, the yearly total impact, that includes the impact of the prior year's raise plus um, uh, multiplied by uh, three and a half percent or three point two five percent plus the new uh, ad from the current work current year's forecast. So the line that says total yearly impact shows the impact in the on the taxes incrementally from time zero for each of those years, and it rises from one million dollars in the first year to almost eight million dollars in the fifth year. So the total increase comes out to $27.7 million. So that's what you're asking the taxpayers to pay more over five years with those increases. And forget your positive assumptions or your negative assumptions I, about the, about the uh, uh, revenue assumptions. This is pure expense discussion, okay? So the, the, the net present value of that, if you discount it at the town's cost of money, which I assume is about 3%, is about $25 million. That turns out to be 12.6% of the, in, in other words, that net, what's the net present value mean? It means if, if we, what's the effect today of all of these expenses on, on the taxpayers? And that's a 12.6% increase over the 23 uh, budget or 16.7% increase over the 23 tax levy. And I just think that the, those are huge numbers. And I'm, I'm trying to understand why the long range planning committee or why the town manager or why the select board is not looking at these expenses and, and, the, and the profound impact they have. That's my question. Rhetorical perhaps, but you can try to answer it. <laughs> um, I, I would just say uh, when the select board makes a decision about putting the question before the, uh, the voters, they will say to the voters, something along the lines of, do you want to vote for a $7 million increase in uh, taxation? Uh, it will go to reasons X, Y, and Z, and you get to vote yes or no. And uh, it will show the average impact per household. Um, and uh, then the voters get the say yes or no and, and make their decision whether they want their property taxes to go up that much every year or not. Um, that is how Prop 2 and a half works. And um, you know, I, you know, I don't have any control over that. That's just the law. That's how the system is. And, and that's the political choice that Prop 2 and a half makes us put before the voters. Thank you. Um, just having sat on long range planning for several years, I have seen lots of spirited discussions um, with a variety of points of views presented. Um, I have never seen the town manager driving the decisions. Uh, I've seen the town manager being, and I've, and I've seen that with, with, you've been in the room and you've done the numbers. Um, be a servant to the other people on long range planning who are making their case. So I just want to throw that out there. And I'll also note that there are uh, two members of the select board attending get yep. long range. Yep. Annie and then Brian. So over the course of this year's meeting of the long range planning committee, we did look at scenarios that did not have the schools asked for them. And then we looked at the app, the, the long range plan with the schools passed in them. And then the long range planning committee had a lengthy discussion about whether or not those ask for justified, should we do them, et cetera, et cetera. And the consensus of that committee was 
we are going to forward this particular scenario three years with these numbers to the select board for consideration. It is true, we didn't take a vote, but if we had taken a vote, the vote would have matched the consensus. Now, second thing to note, in 2019, we held an override. It was a menu override. There were two debt exclusion questions and an override where we were very clear that we were adding $2.8 million, Percy, in your anatomy, $2.8 million of new taxation in order to increase services in the schools. And that question won. The taxpayers were presented with that question. Everything we did to campaign for that override was very clear that we were adding money to the tax base to add services in schools, that this was not just maintaining services. And that question passed with well over 50% of the vote. And I will note, this was a June election where we had something like 13 or 14,000 people voting. And in a town election, the election that elects those of us who have held elected positions in this town, it's unusual for us to get more than 6,000 people to vote. So there were people voting in that election who don't normally vote for the political infrastructure at all, but they voted for that particular effort. We do not lie to people about why we are asking them for a tax increase. No, ever a campaign that I have ever worked on, have we ever hidden how we intended to use that money, including when we were adding services. Madam Chair, just no. a point of personal privilege. I didn't accuse anybody of lying. So I object to you using that term. Well, we didn't hide what we were doing with the money. And you did say, we are not telling the voters what we're doing with this. Saying, we're not telling the voters what I'm showing you on this piece of paper. Because all right, all right, all right, all right, that, all right, that's it. That's beyond, now we're really having two arguments from two people, Brian and then John. Um, I've been in accounting for 44 years. I taught accounting for 15 years. I have a degree in economics. I know where, where the words structural ever uttered. Um, I'm concerned that we, when you look at a problem, we're only looking at the revenue. We need to look at both sides of this. Has what has been done to examine all the expenses across the board everywhere. Uh, as we know, when we budget, we budget conservatively because we know that there's gonna be excess cash at the, at the end of the year because of vacancies and everything else. I think we need to really look a lot harder as we're, because these three years are gonna be nothing compared to the next three years after that. If, and I don't know what the town has done to say, okay, do you know what? We have a problem on spending and we have a problem on revenue. I think that's a fair question. I, I didn't come tonight prepared with a list of all the no's that in we general. have. But uh, we have constrained spending every year. Uh, as I say, every year we ask the departments what they would like, what they would need. And when I say what they would like, it's not because they're hiring their cousins or because they just want to have another person in the office. It's because they have heard from residents from elected officials, from appointed officials, from their own experience, uh, that there are things that uh, they'd like to see more of. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we, the, the library for several years has been asking for more children's librarians. Uh, we've been able to say yes to that to some extent. And the, when we've said yes, it's usually been like a, a half an FTE uh, where they've been asking for three FTEs. So you don't ever see in a budget three more children's librarians, which I am sure if we gave them to them, they would make great use of. But we over and over again have had to say, no, like we can give you a half an FTE this year and let's see what we can do next year. There, I, there is uh, almost no department in the town that I can think of that can't make that similar argument, but and that we've also had to say no to a lot of things. There are things that we do that I think we need to do better than we do. Uh, and we've had to say no to those. So if it would be useful to put that into perspective, to give you 
I can literally show you the list of things that people you know, have. I'm not waiting for specifics. But, know, okay. just, I, I just want you to know that the town has addressed that problem along with uh, all I hear is we, we don't have enough money. I'm sorry, that's just not an answer. B a businessman comes to me and says, I don't have enough money. You cut the expenses. That's the first thing you cut before you raise revenue. So I, I think I also, <laughs> I teach a class on budgeting. Uh, and what I say to my students every year is what budgeting is all about is there are always more demands than there is revenue. And I think the question in Massachusetts under Prop two and a half is do the structures of Prop two and a half allow for that revenue side to rise fast enough to meet the legitimate demands, not the wish for demands, but the legitimate demands. And uh, over the years, the town, and I do believe that the well, this idea of growing up this structural deficit has been in public discussion from town managers, from select board members, even from finance committee members. Uh, I've seen it in writing that uh, under Prop two and a half, we just cannot offer the services that we do today and that we need to expand into the future without asking voters from time to time for tax increases. I have no problem with asking the tax yeah. that, you know, I mean, That's what we're supposed to do. That's why it was written into the law. I just think that before we ask for the money, we need to say, we've tightened as much as we can. And you know, with, with departments, with, with the tax rate growing already at 5%, I'm not sure that's true. I, well, I, you know. Not the tax rate, the average tax bill. Uh, Arlington, if you look at us compared to the town manager 12, we tend to spend less than most other communities. Um, we, uh, it's a good deal to live in Arlington. It's way cheaper from a tax basis than any community around here except Cambridge and Somerville because they have these huge amounts of commercial growth. But the average tax bill in Belmont or Lexington or Winchester or most of the other Western suburbs, all the other suburbs where people are deciding about where to send their kids to school is way higher. And uh, I think that is one of the dynamics that the school committee has been looking at because frankly, one of the ways we've been able to get away with it over the years is that we do not pay our teachers competitively with those other surrounding communities. And that, that is one of the reasons I think the school committee you know, we've, we've gotten off cheap over time. On the town side, um, I, I will just offer my assurance to you that we have uh, worked very hard to keep spending in control. And if it would be useful, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you or any member of the committee to, to just go through what some of that history has been. Um, I'm going to give you one more example of my life, and that's the treasurer's office. When I first came in here, there are a lot of people who said the treasurer's office has too many staff. You need to cut the treasurer's office staff. And I initially agreed with that. Uh, there are a lot of things happening in the treasurer's office over time. Uh, I think we finally got fully staffed about a year ago. So that was in my six or seven year tenure, we finally hit full staffing. Uh, and now we still have, now we have two vacancies. But anyway, <laughs> we brought in a temporary treasurer, somebody who's retired that's been in the treasury business for years. And his feedback to me was that, yes, there is a large staff, but he thinks that our treasurer's office keeps up with its functions better than any office it has seen. And I have seen other treasurer's offices around the state where they fall behind in things like bank reconciliation and all you find fall behind one month. And you can certainly appreciate when you start to fall behind, it's not just a month, everything gets worse and worse. So I have shifted my view and I now think that we, I would not try to cut the treasurer's office staff because I think staying on top of those numbers, reconciling uh, to our receipts and to our bank accounts every month on a timely basis is worth the money we spend on that. 
and I would fight any attempt to try to cut that back. So yes, we haven't cut the way some people might have thought, but I think that's the right decision. I only one comment about the treasurer's office because you know I review that budget. It's not growing at two and a half percent. It's growing less than that. So it's not it's we need to look where the issues are. That's all. Treasures are even the extra jersey is he here? No. Not here. Um, yeah. I'll say nothing about him. <laughs> John? Yeah, I was just gonna read the the override from 2019. Um, you know, the override would permanently increase property taxes by 5.5 million to pay the operating costs of the town and school departments. So to me, that seems like we need the money to just provide basic functions. It doesn't see, I don't see anything about an expansion of service. I just want to it, it, it is in the letter and I, I'd be happy to point it out. To okay, you. thank you. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. We also get all of the campaign literature. I'm sorry, I'm taking it first grant. Uh, thank you. Uh, sure. uh, hey, Sandy, um, you talk about the town, town 12 a lot. How many of the other magical members of the town 12 have a, a structural deficit? Uh, well, I would say um, probably all of them. Uh, the the, 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 the uh, exceptions same. are uh, Needham. Because uh, Needham has a, a very strong um, commercial industrial base. Having worked in the city of Newton and knowing where 128 runs and that all of the commercial space is on the Needham side, not on the Newton side, I know that Needham has a lot of commercial space. Uh, I think there are other communities like uh, that are you know much more residential, like the Belmont that have structural deficits and have had to have uh, overrides on a periodic basis. So I think it, it depends. Yeah. Again, I mentioned Lexington before. Lexington every year has about two and a half million dollars worth of new growth. We get a million dollars. Lexington is two thirds our population, but they are a rich town because they have areas in town where there are a lot more businesses than we do. Also in Lexington, if you build a new house, it's a $2 million house automatically. So their new growth is terrific. So uh, uh, I guess I, I appreciate some of the distinctions between the town 12, you know, but, but that's kind of the point is that is, you know, Lexington's part of the town 12? No, 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 no so, it's not. I so don't. how many, again, um, of the town 12, how different are we? Well, what we try to do is when we sat down to pick those 12 and we did it in conjunction with our unions, with the school committee members, with the select board members to reach a consensus, we tried to pick a range that were similar to Arlington. So there are some poorer, there are some richer, but all are somewhat similar. Um, I would say, again, of the 12, that Needham is probably the one that is the richest and least like us because uh, they, they, they just have taxing capacity that we don't. The others are much more similar to us. And so Needham's the outlier, not Arlington in this. Uh, okay, okay, thank you, sir. So and just a quick question to clarify on commitments when you go for an override. My understanding when we were discussing that school committee budget at the time, was, for example, with special ed, there was a commitment of 7%, I think. My understanding is that's a commitment to budget, not a commitment to spend. Is that, can you explain yeah. why? I mean, I would think to the average voter when this left board on the ballot says it's a, or literature or wherever it shows up, but a commitment, I think most voters wouldn't distinguish it between a commitment to budget and a commitment to spend. So years and years ago, I don't even know when it started. Uh, there was a number picked out for what Fed spending was, and it's been increased every year by 7%. The reality has been um, that some years it's been higher and some years it's been lower, and different people will tell you what that number is. I think the school department doesn't look at its Fed spending based on that number, but rather on the needs of the students it serves. As it should, that if a student needs to be outplaced uh, and has severe needs, that they outplace that student. 
they also, I think, have, have had a commitment to try to in place as many students as possible because it is both financially advantageous and um, I think the idea of inclusion and, and so forth has its own advantages for special ed students. The school spending on special ed gets to be particularly hard to make just a simple argument about because their spending is on students. And some of those categories neatly fit into what you might call special ed. But if you have a student who had been outplaced and now is in the school and maybe has an A but is in a regular classroom, it, that spending on that student uh, in the classroom, that looks like regular spending. It doesn't look like spend except for maybe that A. So I would just say uh, in that regard, and I brought this up in the Long Range Planning Committee, I think at some point we need to relook at the formula and just come up with a single number for the school department for an annual increase. Uh, that I will leave to my successor. <laughs> uh, but you know, from time to time, the long range plan does need to be looked at. And uh, so that might be one way to deal with the issue that you bring up. Anything else? Sophie, Ryan, Topher? Yeah, um, you mentioned when the, the COLA increases, and I think it was one, one, and two, or something like that. With inflation now being much higher, how does that play into all this? In the argument that we have tried time? to make with our unions and uh, is that uh, Arlington has adopted a slow and steady approach, as opposed to some other communities, for example, during COVID, where they offered zeros. Well, we didn't offer zeros. We kept giving them increases. So our argument to them has been, stick with us. We'll give, you know, you're not going to get huge increases any one year, but we're not going to zero you out. And that's been our history. And I would say for all unions, except the police union, that has led to several contracts. Um, so, so far, so good. You know, we'll, we have a new set of contracts that start negotiating next winter for the next round. Um, and we'll see, but that's been the history. Okay. It seems like that could exacerbate the deficit. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, all the towns are going to be subject to it. So well, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. And, you know, we, we do need to pay enough to be able to attract and retain the staff, and that will be part of the calculation. Annie, did you have a question? No, right. I'm sorry. I have yeah. to apologize to John for losing my temper. I was just wondering if something I say is correct. So what I usually tell people when I talk about the structural deficit is I say it's driven by three things. Stead costs, insurance, and pensions. That, do I have that? Or is there, am I missing something? Or is that not quite right? Well, um, the, the thing that has driven the increases, frankly, has been school enrollment. And, and enrollment, right? Yeah. I mean, school enrollment has, again, second fastest growing school system in the state. Uh, and uh, so that has really driven spending increases. I think uh, health insurance, we've done a very good job of trying to keep that under control. And as you see the numbers here, it hasn't risen as quickly as it has in the past. We have programs to pay people incentives not to pay town health insurance and people take advantage of that. Uh, and we try to do a lot of education with our members about what the issue options are. Uh, certainly pension costs going up 6% a year. You know, that's twice the rate of our revenue increase. But it's just the way it is. Um, okay. So is there anything I'm missing? Is there anything else? That... No, I, I, I guess I would say our costs generally, you know, you mentioned inflation. We've been able to keep our costs in line. For example, our energy costs have not gotten out of control. But when I was in working in Newton, that was a budget buster. It has not been a budget buster here. And let's hope that that stays the same. Um, our trash contract, we've done very well with that. Um, we have a trash contract coming up. I think we will likely want to restructure how we do our trash collection. And I'm hoping 
uh, that that will help contain costs. So, you know, those are the kind of things, you know, Brian was asking about for what we do to contain costs. It's things exactly like that that we spend a lot of time on. Right, but some things we don't have control over. Katie? Thank you. Uh, this is all very interesting. I'm surprised no one has brought up this idea that we're looking at another override in three years, and that override is only expected to go for two years. Is that? That's not true. Uh, I, I, I just. Yeah, so, right. No, it's a good question. I, um, I think uh, it is. So the question will be in 2027. If we have that same 5% override, by that time, will it still just be a two year override or has very typically been the case? We push out the number of years that an override lasts because things come in better than we originally anticipated. Um, I think the other thing that is very important in looking at those numbers is that the size of the deficits in the future are much smaller than the ones we're looking at now. So, uh, even if even if, if we had to say have a six percent override in that year to get it to be three or four years, you know the gaps it's going to have to close are much smaller than the ones we're looking at today. Anything else that anyone has? Any questions about the override, or if, if you allow me, any questions for the town manager period about any lingering? Shane. Question about, so what is this so the select board had a presentation about this and what was there? Oh yeah, good question. Uh, so I think they uh, my guess about what the select board is thinking about is uh, have an override probably in the fall. There's been talk about October, but no dates have been brought up. Um, I think it would be likely that it would take a vote on that in June as opposed to waiting to the middle of the summer when people aren't around. Um, and that it would likely be at $7 million figure. Um, that there are still ongoing discussions. I know the school committee and the school department are having about what their needs and asks are. Um, I don't really see today much change in the town number. Um, but that looks like the uh, political process going forward. Um, and following up on that, um, I asked representatives of the school committee to be here to hear these questions. And I'm um, in June before we break up for the for the, the year. Uh, I'm going to invite the schools to come to our meeting and bring us up to date as to what they're thinking and what their asks are going to be. So we'll have an opportunity to hear uh, more concrete things, more refined things maybe, um, then before we will be asked to weigh in yay or nay on whatever override it, it is. So, um, so that will uh, yeah, probably our last meeting in June. So we'll talk about the, the time of that, Annie. So, so just because we've got a lot of new people here, and I'm assuming we're going to be in keeping with past practice, which is that once the select board has declared that there is going to be an override, we take a vote as to whether or not we as a committee support that override. And whatever the majority votes for then becomes the position of the finance committee. Now, we are constrained by practice in campaigning for candidates because we don't want uh, people to be concerned that we are having outsized political influence because we supported particular candidates for particular offices. But we're allowed to individually campaign on issues but the position of the committee will be whatever the committee votes. And so let's say the committee voted not to support that override, despite how I feel about it. 
when asked, the official position of the Finance Committee is we do not support this override. And then I'm free to work on the campaign. Am I correctly describing our past practice? Okay, so. Um, I'm wondering if at some point, every once in a while, people mention the fact that they feel like we're being um, retroactive in the way we approach budgets. We don't really have a place to be proactive, mm -hmm. but I'm, and it may not even be in our charter to be proactive. However, I'm wondering if it <clears throat> might be worth it to either as an entire group or a smaller group look at some of the expenses in the town mm -hmm. and look at if there's other ways of potentially reducing them. Not in the next year, not in the next six months, maybe, but maybe in the next two to five years um, and get creative about that. And in order to do that, we would have to get some homework done amongst ourselves and potentially amongst department heads and or HR. And so that's a question I'm throwing out and I could make a motion for it or not because we this as a casual discussion, but I wanted to throw that out. I think that may be worth discussing as a as a group at a, another meeting. Yeah, that's fine. Um, before we break up for the summer. Yeah. I think that'd be a good idea. Any other questions for the town manager, Carol? Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. <laughs> I would just like to comment on, on first of all, on what uh, Carolyn just said. I think the school committee and the select board are, are really responsible for, for those things. I don't know whether this are. We shouldn't be in there trying to micromanage the departments. That's just my personal opinion. And on the question of um, the two year override, so, you know, my view is that the the decision of how much the override is and when we when we have it and how long it lasts, it's, it's, you're moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. Okay. The real number is the real question is how much more are we spending? That's the question. And and and, and what we have before us is this uh, huge number, which I think we need to discuss sometime in the future. Any other questions? Anything I did have one that's sure. clear tonight, which we're talking about new growth and how that does lead to more revenues, um, but it can also lead to more expenses for more people. How much of to the chapter 70 money, you know, how much of our like student budget or our school budget does that cover? Or I should say maybe, you know, how much would an increase in chapter 70, you know, cover the increase in enrollment? It really depends on whether we are getting foundation aid where the, our foundation budget has gone up faster than a required contribution or whether we're getting minimum aid, which doesn't really cover our costs. So uh, if the years where we've got minimum aid, we've got about a 1% increase in chapter 78. The years where we've got foundation aid, we got a set, last year we got 17 and a half percent increase. So it, it, it totally depends on where we fall on, on, on that scale. Um, and then there's probably infinite variations after that. So uh, give me a call sometime and we'll have a cup of coffee and talk about this. All right. Um, Chrissy or Len, uh, is there anything that you want to? add or say i know as i just said we'll have a more lengthy discussion in june but is there anything you want to say anything tonight to the group um have anything to add no we look forward to talking to you in june the one thing i think sandy didn't mention is just going way back to the asks um in addition to changing the special education increase from seven to decreasing it from seven to six point five percent we also gave up in FY24 $600,000 of one time COVID money and in FY25 $300,000. So the total asks 
are actually almost a million dollars less than what you're seeing on the uh, uh, just the numbers that you're and you're seeing on there. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I uh, don't come to the finance committee that often, but I always appreciate talking with you and hearing your questions. Even if we don't agree about everything, I think it's important for all of us that we get the numbers right and understand how they work. Um, and uh, I know everybody in the room is trying to do the best thing for the citizens of this great town. And I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Sorry, let me pull them up. Okay, Josh has his hand up. Alan, Ellen, are you for the minutes? I think you were absent that yeah. night. Yeah, I'll so, abstain. I was absent that night. I think that's 15. In that case, I'll abstain. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 15, 4. Zero against and two abstentions. Uh, one more item I'd like to one I want to take a revoke of a warrant article just to be safe. And this is the cemetery appropriation. Transfer of funds article 58. We voted to transfer 210,000 for potential care to the cemetery commissioners, but we did not uh, specifically vote this, uh, uh, an appropriation of 75,000 from potential care to the capital budget to pay for a excavator. So arguably we took that vote within the capital budget, but I'm just going to be, uh, just make sure that we do it um, formally. So, so, so second. second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That has been approved. And, and Josh, did you vote yes? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's it. We, um, Tara, Al Jones, and I are working on finalizing <clears throat> the FinCon report, which we hope might be done by tomorrow. Um, and uh, Tara's been doing a fabulous, heroic job, and Alan is being Alan. <laughs> so hopefully that will be ready and sent out uh, over the next few days. And then we will not meet until the night of um, town meeting, which is 24. 24th. 24th. So, we still haven't figured out where, but it'll be 7.30 somewhere near or in town hall. So every night, we need it. Every yeah. night, unless there's clearly nothing. Unless you send a note saying. Yeah. 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 So yeah. That half hour between 7.30 and the start of town on Monday. Go watch your email. 
So why should you know? Yeah. All right, if no one has any other business, I have your motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, you're done. Thank you.